yet again, we have the fact that uh, the heavens and earth were created in six days by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that he was not even touched with fatigue. In Exodus, we see uh, that God is said to have made the heavens and earth in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Yet again, from Exodus, the clear indication that the Quranic author knows stuff from Exodus and is intentionally uh, going ahead and editing it as it doesn't confirm, the Quranic author does not uh, confirm absolutely everything. It is true, right, that the Quran has a lot of knowledge on the Torah and also Talmud and other things as well, and also the Injil, in what it considers to be the Injil. It assumes the reader has knowledge of these things, but at the same time it contradicts. But again, if the Quran has so much extensive knowledge, even to the point where it's interacting with the Hebrew and rare texts, rare texts like the Talmud, then surely the author of the Quran knows that in certain cases it's intentionally uh, contradicting what the Bible says. Doesn't that show us that he doesn't believe the Bible is fully preserved? I mean, it would be impossible to think that he even knows the Hebrew, but he accidentally makes mistakes about certain details of the story, even though certain details come up as like refutations, like Solomon didn't disbelieve instead of saying like that that seems like a response um so yeah the idea that if you find disagreements that the best position to take is that the Quran is aware of this and is correcting it i think again is somewhat circular it is true right that the quran has a lot of knowledge on the torah and also talmud and other things as well and also the injil The clear indication that the Quranic author knows stuff from Exodus and is intentionally uh, going ahead and editing it as it doesn't confirm, the, author, the Quranic author does not uh, confirm absolutely everything. So the Quranic author knows that he's possibly uh, either contradicting our tradition or contradicting the Bible, but he's uncertain. Um, well, I mean, I think he probably thinks that he knows that he's got it right. I think that's what he's banking on, yeah. Right, but he knows it's a possibility because you know, right now it's just a, it's a, it's a jab in the dark. He's jabbing in the dark, doesn't know if it's old tradition, doesn't know if it's the Bible, and yet is editing these traditions he's hearing. He knows it's possible that he's editing the Bible at this current point, what is written. He knows that's a possible thing that is occurring. Yeah, I mean, it depends if he heard the correct oral tradition, right? Because all tradition can have variants in it. Like Dr. Right. Stephen so, Schumer so, points out. Yeah, yeah. So, so the Quranic author knows it's possible that he's editing content within the scriptures, meaning you basically consider the point. Uh, to just conclude, uh, if you just go back to my questioning, uh, Chris actually indirectly conceded the debate, saying that the author or the author of the Quran actually uh, is jabbing in the dark and is uh, is allowing for there to be room for the author of the Quran to edit parts of the Bible. He does, the author of the Quran does not have certainty that he's only taking from old traditions. He, he's possibly editing biblical traditions and has no problem with that. What does that show you about his attitude towards the Bible? Muhammad, whoever he was, just didn't understand what the Injil and Torah were exactly. He couldn't read all right, so he had to hear things. That would explain why he gets a lot of the stories generally right, but then totally contradicts the prior scriptures without really having any knowledge of it. He probably thought Christians and Jews were just making it up. Uh, and didn't realize they were actually coming from scripture. It is true, right, that the Quran has a lot of knowledge on the Torah and also Talmud and other things as well, and also the Injil, in what it considers to be the Injil. It assumes the reader has knowledge of these things, but at the same time it contradicts. The Quran contradicts the Torah and the Injil. The Quran over and over again contains verses that are just not compatible with the prior scriptures. For example, you have the classic Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 157, that seems to imply that Jesus didn't die on a cross, which is a claim made in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. To quote Gabriel Reynolds, now, uh, he has a whole commentary called the Quran and the Bible, and I've read a lot of it. Same. And the whole point is he's going basically ayah by ayah in the Quran and he's trying to connect as uh, almost every ayah of the Quran to something in the Bible or something in rabbinic literature and, and whatnot. 
And he's basically showing how the Quran is sometimes agreeing with something that's in these previous texts or it's correcting it. He even goes so far as to saying uh, there are times where the Quranic uh, phrasing is influenced by the Hebrew of the Bible. And it's it's responding to the he actual Hebrew and making a pun on the Hebrew. So if the, if the author of the Quran has such extensive knowledge of the Bible that it not only knows the Bible, but rare traditions like the Talmud wasn't popular uh, at that point. It was popular in Babylonia, but not here. And it even is responding to the Hebrew, but according to you at the same time, he doesn't even know that the gospels say that Jesus died. How do you square that up? How can you? That's a really good question. So it is true, right, that the Quran has a lot of knowledge on the Torah and also Talmud and other things as well, and also the Injil and in what it considers to be the Injil. It assumes the reader has knowledge of these things, but at the same time, it contradicts, right? So, um, so what I would say is, I don't actually, I'm not convinced that four one five seven, understood in the traditional Muslim way, is correct. That would be my response ultimately. I think it's more refuting the Jews in their understanding of what they have done by having the Messiah killed. I think it's basically saying, no, it wasn't you that did this, because only Allah is the one who allows these things to happen. So uh, that would be my understanding of that. Or well, you have the classic Surah An Nisa, Ayah 157, that seems to imply that Jesus didn't die on a cross. Um, so, what I would say is, I don't actually, I'm not convinced that 4157, understood in the traditional Muslim way, is correct. For example, Dr. Gabriel Reynolds makes his point to use Gabriel Reynolds' terms, and Dr. Gabriel Reynolds and others have made this point as well. People like Gabriel Reynolds. People... Is Gabriel Reynolds a scholar you feel to? In... He's someone you feel to in your, your videos, correct? One yes. minute. Uh, does he believe the author of the Quran edits material that he hears from the Jews and Christians? I think he's very carefully diplomatic about that, from my understanding. Expand. As in, do he, he doesn't explicitly say. I think he tries to, to be very. Uh, critical but not um uh making his opinions known he tries to stick purely to scholarship well gabriel reynolds says in his book the quran and the bible is in page three uh the quran has not simply borrowed material from jews or christians this is just page three of his work the quran has not simply borrowed material from jews or christians instead it has consciously reshaped biblical material to advance its own religious claims uh, are so you sure had, you're not had, quoting had, someone who gives a foreword because i've read no, that this this is Gabriel say Reynolds book page three the Quran and the Bible on his commentary of the Quran. Okay, well maybe he does then. Maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, the one scholar that you heard him quote um, Reynolds uh, <laughs> from page three of his book it contradicts him. <laughs> so like he's, he's not doing thorough research. So the main assumption to talk here is does the Quran really affirm all of the Bible at its time? Well, the answer is no. The burden, the proof is on Chris to show an absolute confirmation with no exceptions at all to this rule. And inshallah, today I'm going to be going through and destroying that claim of um, absolute confirmation. So th this is my position. Uh, the Quran generally affirms the truths contained with the scriptures at its time. It's going to be a general affirmation of these categories I've just listed. And the general affirmation will be restricted to whatever is confirmed by the Quran and Sunnah. Anything contradicting it, we are to discard. And anything in between, we are to remain agnostic. We are neither to affirm or deny. Here's an example from Matthew 23, right? You have Jesus commanding the Pharisees. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. As so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, right? But the Pharisees, they taught the oral law. Right? So if this is not just a general command, this is an absolute command, and we go like with the sort of uncharitable reading of texts, this is going to be a contradiction. Because we see times where Jesus, peace be upon him, in the Gospels, he actually condemns the Pharisees for certain oral practices, right? So he doesn't believe in everything that they teach. The Pharisees also teach that Jesus, peace be upon him, isn't the Messiah. Is he saying to take those teachings from the Pharisees? Is he, is he saying uh, for, <clears throat> for his disciples and for his followers to go ahead and believe absolutely everything? Of course not, as I, as I just made mention. Uh, this is a restricted obeyance. This is an absolute. So let's be consistent now and be charitable, just as I'm being charitable with the text here. Be charitable with the Quran when it makes uh, general stipulations and general commands. Did Jesus uh, believe in all of the oral law that the Pharisees were teaching? Uh, I'm going to say no. Uh, do you believe in Matthew 23, Jesus is commanding the disciples to obey absolutely everything that the Pharisees teach? 
is it absolutely everything? Yep. Right, I'm asking. I'm, I'm asking. Okay, okay so he's no. not right. So you believe this is a general statement where Jesus is saying to obey the Pharisees, where there's exceptions and it's not an absolute thing, right? Mm -hmm. Why don't you have that level of uh, charitability when you read the Quran? The Quran contradicts the Torah and the Injil. There's a claim that actually. The Hebrew people are not the children of Allah. Surah Al-Maida, I 18, for example, as many other verses indicate as well. But of course, the Torah is full of verses, Deuteronomy 14, 1, as an example, where the people, the Hebrew people are described as being children of God. I can accept that during the uh, prior to the Prophet Muhammad's time, uh, during Jesus' time and during the time of the, the Old Testament, people were allowed to title themselves as sons of God. Ibn Taymiyyah makes mention of this. Ibn Kathir makes mention of this. This was a possible title used back then with the proper meaning. This, this was allowed in a metaphorical sense, not in a literal sense. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 5, it even makes mention the house of Israel are not titled as sons of God when they sin, when uh, in, and that they lose that title, right? So this is uh, in direct uh, parallel with the Quranic verse uh, that you had in mind in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 18.